I'm really interested in masculinity and men. Um, and really, that's, that's really going to be the focus of what we're talking about, the development of masculinity. We're going to talk in detail about my study. And then the thing that I really want you to do is to be pondering how this has some kind of application. The way that you connect with men, right, in a therapeutic uh, relationship, because um, I'm thinking in terms of, as a, a therapist work that works with couples, if it weren't for you ladies, we wouldn't get many of those guys in. You bring them kicking, screaming, dragging, threatening, coercing, whatever it is that needs to be done to get them there. Why would that be? I mean, I, I remember thinking about this because remember, I did my original master's degree and worked at a hospital. I worked at a hospital for 10 years. And remember what a challenge it was uh, to engage men in therapy. I had a fella say to me, this will really get you. Um, uh, his wife dragged him in. And he's, he looked at me, and he's very suspicious. And it didn't necessarily turn out well. They did not come back. Uh, the relationship did not make it. And this was a guy that was, he was in his mid-40s at the time. But this is his, the quote that he said. Um, he said, um, counseling is to men what rape is to women. He made that pronouncement before I even had a chance to say anything. I mean, really, if it wasn't for you ladies, we would not be, we would not have a business. There would be no business. Now, I hope the generation of men that are, are being socialized and reared now, and it would be interesting to have that conversation with you in terms of whether or not you think the generation is different. Yes, we're doing more housework. Mm -hmm. The studies say we're still only doing about a quarter, <laughs> but we're doing a heck of a lot more than we did before. But the question would be, on a psychological level, is that uh, changed in terms of men being more willing to disclose or engage? Um, or are we still really reluctant to be exposed and to be vulnerable? Yes, they're still reluctant. I think men are still reluctant. Even though they are taking on major roles, they'll, OK, dear, blah, 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 and they just go about their business. I've seen it with my parents, and I've seen it with younger couples and, and young marriages. It's because they don't have that communication. It's just, yes, dear, no, dear. And then if something blows up, it's just like, okay, well, all right, dear. It, you appease the woman, and that's not what the woman wants. Okay. Okay, I could launch a different direction. But no, gonna, you can't. No, no, I got to I want to I wanna <laughs> stay. I like the face. So, so, so I want I want to take you back to actually when I was a little kid. When I was a little kid, we lived on a farm. Actually, we lived in North Braddock in the steel town. My dad worked at the steel mill, and uh, this was when people were trying to kind of not only get out into the suburbs, but maybe get a little land and a gentleman's farm, something like that. So we lived in this place called Mount Pleasant near Greensburg for about six years. And it was, it was idyllic. It, it really was. Um, but dad ends up losing the job at the mill, uh, becomes a truck driver. We end up losing the farm and had to move back into North Braddock, which I'm sure had to be quite a, a blow in terms of both uh, he and my mom. And we ended up renting this very small place, I can remember. Um, you know, for 40 bucks a month in, on Middle Street, 837 Middle Street, North Brad. But prior to that, I remember looking at my dad and wondering about my dad because he was this absolutely gorgeous man. If you've ever seen old wrestling pictures of a guy named Gorgeous George, who Muhammad Ali patterned um, the the kind of challenging talk. Uh, he patterned it after Gorgeous George. Well, my dad looked that way. It was really big, 6'5", built. Before they had uh, um, weights, 
but he was, you know, he worked uh, construction, that sort of thing. But he also was kind of given to um, alcohol and violence. And so here's this, here I am, is this little boy coming up. Is that what's expected of me? I mean, I remember even as a little kid reacting, not only in terms of my own concern for safety, but saying to myself, I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to be that. Um, how am I going to, because I'm watching my mom be mistreated, how am I going to treat, I'm five, six years old, right? So I have been obsessed with masculinity, right? I, I really, I have. So the fact that I end up going to school and do a dissertation on masculinity, I mean, it, it was not in my head at the time, it just kind of bubbled up the way things do. But that was all kind of the, the genesis. But in my clinical psych training, I felt as if they really missed a really important component in terms of how we grow and develop as people. I think they caught um, gender pretty well, even though you could talk about the biases and some of the theories, same way that they talk about health bias in terms of um, not enough women being represented, and that you know, how similar or different is it? Um, you can talk about it as it relates to uh, ethnicity, right? Uh, culture, depending on the culture. But what do you think? I mean, as I've, I'm this kind of budding therapist, that I, as a you know, looking at the world of psychology, that I feel as if they forgot. Any guesses? Yeah. Think about what I ended up getting my PhD in. What was it? It was in sociology. <laughs> hmm? Well, the object. <laughs> Socioeconomic class. Class is a major determinant of how we kind of are socialized and the norms that we end up internalizing to become men and women. I mean, so it's not just as it relates to um, gender or race or ethnicity or culture. You've got this whole class dimension. So I was drawn. I was drawn to sociology. And I thought to myself, I didn't want to go back and learn the same things. I felt as if psychology missed that piece of it. Uh, they, they give credence to SES, but I, I really don't think that there's been enough. Now, you've got to remember, this is, this is back a little ways. You, you hear um, those fields, both of those disciplines, you know, really give uh, um, a lot more talk to SES. So I'm trying to think about uh, masculinity. I'm trying to think about why I can't get these guys to come into treatment, come into my office, and I'm, and I'm just pondering and I started to dig into the literature and uh, came across a really um, fascinating book. Uh, I got to remember this was when the feminist movement was really just beginning to take hold in terms of um, both uh, psychology and, and sociology. And there was a, uh, a female, a woman um, by the name of uh, Nancy Chodoro, and she wrote a book called The Reproduction of Mothering. And in it, she creates this argument for why boys are socialized and become relationally deficient. And she identifies the Industrial Revolution as the culprit. That when, prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, we were agrarian, you know, and so men would have ongoing contact with their fathers. And the, from her perspective, this would result in a relational male because there would be these affective processes that would take place that the boy would learn directly from his father. The Industrial Revolution hits, what happens? The man is removed from the life world of the family and the argument is the only person the boy has to model his gender identity is in contrast 
to his mother, as opposed to the connection with his father. And she articulated that this is why men are always resisting, always pulling away, keeping folks at bay, right? That that, that would, would all have been a part of it, because he's not going to move uh, towards his mom in the same way that he moves toward um, his dad being the same. And to take you into my household to add a little credibility to it, although I'm not sure I um, uh, bought Nancy's ideas uh, completely, I remember when our little boys were coming up. I got two sons. And um, man, they were just getting about that age, um, maybe like four or five years old, right? And, you know, with kids, I mean, you try to go to the bathroom privately, but it's not always possible. So, you know, I'm in taking care of business, and all of a sudden, boom, the other two are there, and they're dropping there, and they're standing, and ours the three of us. And we got three trails going, right? And they look at me. They look at themselves, and they look at me, right? And they're, they're taking this experience in, in terms of it being a, a connection, and they're identifying. They're saying, that's me. That's me. That's what I'm going to be later. I'm going to look like that later, right? Now, granted, I'm, I'm putting words in their um, mouth, but you can see, I remember the reaction I had. I mean, I'm <laughs> trying to, but at the same time, kids don't give you that same kind of space. So I think um, this was the first real attempt to talk about gender and, and how we socialize and have it from a macro perspective, that you had this major macro transformation and how would that play out in the psychological lives of boys um, because they would be the ones that would be more impacted. The argument is that women have the benefit of a continuous relationship with their moms. Not all ladies, but most. And in that, in that connection, even though you know it could be a lot of um, arguing, fighting, that sort of thing. The argument is that the connection is rarely ever severed, even when kid, you know, the person marries and, and uh, kids come, and that sort of thing. It could be that the culture continues to socialize girls becoming women to be the caregivers. I don't think that has necessarily changed. One of the reasons many times the, the women really are the kind of the spoke, or the, the hub, not the spoke. And uh, you think about your families and how much really revolves around, um, you know, mom nurturing. You know, and the, the argument here is that, that women are socialized to nurture, be the caregiver, and uh, that identification with, with the, the role of the woman with their mother, it's continuous. There's no disruption. So you've got women with these great relational capacities, according to Chodoro, and men who, man, they're, they're struggling, right? So they're struggling. Okay, so I'm chewing all of this literature. I'm, I'm looking at it from a lot of different angles. And I started to consult with some of the other professors at USC, and I said, uh, I want to maybe compare um, some different groups of men. Uh, and this is built on the idea that was just kind of coming into its own also that said that there's a plurality of masculinities out there. There's not just one. Um, and depending on where you go, um, even similar groups may look very different. 